Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon with Drake and Marie. I am your host, Max Alexander Drake. I'm an award-winning novelist. I was the lead fiction writer for a massive game from Sony. I'm writing a video game now. I've pretty much written in every format that exists. As always, I'm here with my ho- uh, co-host, Marie. Hi, I'm Marie. I have a YouTube channel dedicated to fantasy world building called Just In Time Worlds. And I am a fantasy author of the Sangwheel Chronicles. Last podcast, we talked about making magic systems. And this con- content, this podcast, we're going to kind of go into how yeah. we write magic systems in effect, like how we actually use them in our writing and kind of really focusing on how we introduce them. Because I think that's where a lot of people mess up is they they fall in love so much with their magic system that that they don't follow what we were preaching earlier, which is it's there for the story. It's there for the, you know, for the enjoyment of the reader. And you need to let it drive the story as much as you possibly can. And also very important, I feel, how you show a magic system rather than laying out the rules of a magic system as though you're writing a campaign module, you know, as though you're writing a, a D&D rule set or something. Exactly. We're going to start with with one of mine where we introduce the internally facing magic of hobby for the first time. I'm going to share a document. If you are not um, watching this on YouTube, we will read aloud. We are going to share the documents if you are on YouTube. Okay, so this is from The Hidden Blade, which is the first book. And it is in chapter two. It's the first time that we see magic in this world. And we're inside the head of the person who's using the magic. The point of view character is called Louis. Louis Louis stopped in a quiet alley close to the square and stripped off the traveler's cloak, revealing beneath it the green doublet with its seed pearl buttons. He stuffed the cloak into his side sack, slung over one shoulder as was the custom here in the South. Carefully, he took the merchant's hat with its bright band and green baggy cap out of the sack and settled it on his head pulling the cap so that it sat jauntily on his crown, the tip hanging to to the side. He touched his purse and his heart, feeling the blood pulsing through his body, his mind stilling in time with that rushing flow. He reached into himself on the beat of his heart, his mind sinking below the layers of skin and flesh, tapping on the core strength of his Elamar. He released the power as he touched his lips, feeling his face shift slightly, becoming leaner. He knew that his skin tone would darken a few shades, disguising his northern heritage, and he felt the slant of his eye socket smooth out. As he touched the merchant's hat, his well-disciplined mind boxed up Louis into a quiet corner, and he remembered, knew who he was. Leno the merchant walked out of the alley that Louis the Traveller had entered. Well, one of the things that I want to point out is one of the things I really like about this is you didn't baby the reader with information that the that the POV knows. The POV knows how this works. So you just give that to the reader. You don't go, so, Mr. Reader, what happens is he uses his magic to change his appearance. You just let it happen. And then, you know, through subtext, the reader infers that's what magic does. What I try to do here is I try to show what it feels like to draw on the power source, but there's also elements of it. Like one of the things people have asked me, if all, all they've read is up to here, is they're like, are the, are the hats magic? And the answer is no, the hats are not magic. The hats are a mnemonic for Louis to remember which character goes with the appearance that he's creating, because the magic is all about changing his face. So it's also an interesting kind of juxtaposition, but it keeps readers very interested because they're like, oh, the hat's magic. Tell me about the hats. (laughs) The hats are actually about Louis. Yes. Anything. And and that goes back to what we talked about earlier, where it's you want readers questioning things. You want them engaged because then they will that will drive them forward to go, oh, wow, I really need to figure out how this is working. What's going on here? You know, it's why. 
when my beta readers will read a chapter and they're like, oh, no, 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 you can't leave me here. You've got to give me that information here. Don't, no, 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 no. You have to give me that information. It's like, no, I literally have to make you want me to give you that information here. That's kind of the point because now there's no way you're not going to read the next chapter. Exactly. That's exactly what we're looking for there. That was my my introduction of the internally facing magic um, of my world and, and how I introduce that moment of hobby. So you can also introduce magic in a very different way where, and this is often used if you have access to a younger character, where you can set up a teaching scenario where the character learns and the reader learns. And you can do this either with a point of view character who's a teacher or a point of view character who's a pupil. You know, I fought against this for a long time. I don't use a lot of tropes in my writing and I really try to stay away from, well, everyone explains their magic through this thing. But one of the things that I like to do when I get the opportunity is I like to make my reader feel the way my characters are feeling. And so the beautiful thing about this magic system is you actually have to adopt a different vision to see the magic and you really can't see the world anymore. And so it's this weird kind of the way things shift and I really wanted them to experience that and it just worked as a kind of a refresher course because he this character has been picked up to go to a much bigger place and a much more powerful place and so the teacher here is just like well I'm going to make sure you at least don't embarrass me and so that's kind of how I justified it to myself so I'll share my screen now so this is actually the introduction chapter for this character. So you literally have read nothing. You've never read the magic. You've never read the character or anything like that. And I'm not going to read much of it. I just kind of want to talk about how I rolled it out and everything like that. Reality roiled in, into a kaleidoscope of colored light swimming across Malant Corps' field of vision. It's like opening my eyes underwater, yet everything looks crisp and clear. I just can't tell what anything is. Now, Malant, focus. Bend your mind and see the room around you. See your Sarlamag. Malant's primary instructor stood in front of him, at least... That's the direction his voice is coming from. A dizzying array of colors was all Malant saw through the sight of Sukai. His seer's robes rustled. Tell me what I'm holding. The scene before Malant was off-putting. Strain as he might, he could, he could see no difference between the multitude of swirling colors that made up the room and anything his teacher might or might not be holding in his hands, or even the seer himself, for true. He needed to settle his thoughts, to calm down. He brought up images of home, his mom and papa, laughing and singing in the communal dining hall, playing Barca with his younger brother, Ardari or his cousin Silm, his little sister Tariona and baby Rick. As always, the memories of his family flooded, or as memories of his family brought a smile to his lips. With his, mo with his motions more in control, he took a deep breath, fixing upon the spot he guessed his teacher's chest should be. Malant allowed the floating dots, spectrals, he reminded himself, to di differentiate one from another on their own as he had been taught. Within a few heartbeats, the seer emerged into view, becoming distinct from the background. The man didn't move nor take on any real shape. Rather, the colored spectrals forming Salamak's body appeared connected, interacting in a way Malant still failed to understand, even after two seasons training with Sukai. Soon, other patterns emerged, and the room's contents took shape before him in the eerie, multicolored sight of Sukai. And so I start this off. I really wanted to showcase how freaking odd it was because they do have to change their vision and so obviously right off the bat you can go well, how do they how could they even fight with this well they can't like they can't even see anything and later on he actually walks and everything turns into a buzzing bees that fly around him and all this other stuff so it, it really showcases the type of magic that it is that it is more carpentry magic it's more uten you, you know utensil type magic he's not casting fireballs and actually they even talk about it because uh, in the scene, uh, the seer burns a piece of parchment and he has him explain what it looks like as it's burning in the sight of Sukai. And after that's all over, when they're actually just talking about it, and he's dropped the site and he's just talking about it. Uh, his seer is like, you know, could I use Sukai to, to turn that burnt piece of parchment back into a new piece of parchment? And, uh, and Malant's like, yeah, of course, but it would take like six hours. I mean, it'd be much easier just to go down to the store and buy a new piece. You're not going to use it for that. That would be a complete waste of time. Um, and so that really starts building, like this magic is very, very, very slow and very, very, very much. That's why I call it carpentry magic. You're just for building stuff. 
what I like about this introduction as well is that we get the names of things, like we get spectals and so on. And the nice thing about a classroom introduction of magic is it's low stakes, you know, so it's not like the intensity of using magic in combat. So it gives the reader time to absorb those terms. So when you use them in combat, it flows naturally off the tongue because you don't have to reintroduce it. I do, I do like a classroom introduction right. if it fits the story. Like, don't, don't shoehorn it in there. <laughs> don't do that. But if you do have a classroom situation, it, it, it is worth thinking about, you know, whether you can do a little bit of magic exploration. Another thing, just to kind of bring this up, you have to introduce a conflict at the beginning of your scene. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily the scene's conflict, mm -hmm. but it has to be something that makes you go, oh, that's kind of interesting. How is this going to resolve? Literally, the conflict that's res that's thrown at the reader right at the beginning is I can't see why can't I see what is this why is the world a, a kaleidoscope of colored light swimming across my vision so that's it isn't a, when we say conflict I'm never talking about like oh John's fighting Jack that's yes that's a type of conflict but there's so many other types of conflict so this is a conflict between the POV trying to see the world around him and not being able to and that for me is enough and again a lot of the stuff we talk about is subjective. So somebody out there might be reading this or listening to this and going, yeah, it doesn't do that for me. Great. It doesn't do it for you. That's kind of why everything we do is subjective. But for me and for the vast majority of people who have read this that have told me this, that's what it does for them. It's like, ooh, that's interesting. That makes me want to continue reading. I just need to find out why he can't see and, and how that works. And then I slowly keep bringing them deeper and deeper and deeper. And I give them the spectacles. That's why I don't even start with spectacles. I start with colored dots of light. Because everyone knows what that is. And then once I've established that it's colored dots of light, then he chastises himself with a dude, call them spectrals. That's what they're called. Uh, because he is a student. So he's still kind of learning terminology himself and everything like that. Technically not because it's been two years. So he probably wouldn't make that mistake if that's really for the reader. But it's still my way of organically or at least more organically getting it into the readers so that um, it feels more natural. I also I also like that we are getting because I, I I did read this but I mean it's been a it's been a minute but I like that we get here the title of the magic user in that it's the seer and it's used as a title because I recollect that in chapter one that term was introduced but not explained or chapter two that term was introduced but not explained so. It's always nice to also introduce the title that your majors carry, because there probably is something that they're called, like hobbyers, seers, majors, wizards, something. Well, even this, this paragraph here from 14 to 17. Uh, now, I haven't finished my final mm -hmm. edits on this chapter, so this is one that I'm still working on. And reading this, I was like, yeah, I'm going to cut this down a little bit, because it's about half too long, in my opinion. Using his home life to calm his nerves is a natural thing to do. A lot of people do that. It's a little too long. I made my point, and this is, this is a little bit overwritten, and so I'm going to cut this down a little bit. But another thing it does for me is this is the first time you've met Malant. You've heard his name because in Ardari's chapter, which you've already had, I think, two Ardari. No, there's just been one Ardari chapter at this point. But we still met Ardari. We've met all of these people. We've met Siln. We've met Tariona. Um, technically, we didn't meet Rick, the baby, because he was not in the scene, but we met his mom and papa. And so by, by doing that callback, it brings up all the fuzzy, you know, feelings that you had when you met our dairy and you were in that, that little, you know, their little country environment and their farming community and everything like that. And so it connects the two very fast and you can bring all that information that our dairy, that you got in the our dairy chapter about what these two parents or what these two boys parents were like what their upbringing was like and everything like that so since i already set that up with our dairy all i do is a call back and say hey remember remember our dairy and all those people that that raised him the way he did this is just a kid off the college he was still raised in that same household he's still from that same family so i can bring in quickly a lot of the things that i've already worked to introduce by just making sure that i connect the readers to that because they might miss i mean even though Malant was introduced as, as Ardari's brother, that's all you got. And that was in chapter two, and now we're in chapter five, and maybe they forgot. And so I just want to 
remind them again of that? Some magic systems are heavy on emotions. Like the the dark side of the force is specifically heavy on emotions. You need to be angry. You need to evoke your emotions. You know, I always say that presumably you could use the dark side of the force if you have extremely happy emotions too, because it's all about emotions, right? But anyway, that's a completely different tangent. It's interesting that he specifically calms his emotions, that he looks to his family life to calm his emotions. It also tells the reader that in this magic system, it's important to not be intense, to, to look at it as an engineer. And that to me, what, what it invokes to me is, because I'm always looking for the combat side. So I'm like, if you got to be calm, and you're being attacked by, you know, some creature that's going to rip your face off. How is that going to work? Um, not that you could do anything with this magic that would save you anyway, because all you could do is maybe make his sweater warmer. It's not really going to help you not get your face ripped off. But again, this is not the only, there's actually three versions of magic in this world, and this is just one of them. And this changes even, because um, technically there's six versions of magic, because each type of magic has a, has a normal version and a supercharged version. So yeah, it's just, it's... It's a way to roll the system out slowly. Um, yes, the classroom is cliche, and I don't like necessarily using it. This is the only time I've ever used it in anything I've ever written. But I think it works. It, it allows me to go through the entire thing. Later on, they're actually sitting in chairs, and he's actually asking him questions. They get sidetracked on. They hear a, a massive screaming from outside, and they're like, is that from the Coliseum? You know, and you've already read the chapter where the beast man is fighting in the Coliseum. So you already know exactly what's happening over there. And now they're hearing it. So that ties them together. And you're like, oh, they're in the same town. And he even asks, like, because the beast man is unique to this world. And so he's like, do you, do you believe the rumors? You know, and I think Sir Mike says something like that the beast is nine feet tall and eats men for breakfast. I doubt it. And so it just kind of shows that there's been a lot of rumors going on and the excitement of this thing coming to the Coliseum to fight and all this other stuff. It just makes the world feel more real, makes the world feel more, you know, joined and connected and everything like that. I think the one thing that I will say about using a classroom is unless the classroom is going to be the focal center of your books, the way it is for, say, Harry Potter, which is a school story, essentially, don't do more than one classroom scene you know doing it once is fine like it shows the setup and so on but if it's not going to be the focal like core of your of your story don't do too many classroom scenes don't do it every time you right. want to introduce an aspect of your magic that's that's going to get a little boring <laughs> I, I ran across this i do want to take us or chase a little rabbit here because this there's also things, you know, we, we talk about subtext. We're actually planning on maybe even doing an entire podcast on subtext. Subtext is really complicated and really tough. And um, I haven't necessarily agreed to doing an entire podcast on it. But like one of the things you can do with dialogue and with narration is you can really kind of show not just the attitudes of characters themselves, but even entire society. So so that thing that I was was talking about, Mont had heard the game, Mont had heard of the games, of course though he'd never been because he's a college student. He's in this town. He basically is locked in this thing. And he says, do you think the rumors are true of the lion man? I mean, see your Sarlamac turned back with a frown because he was looking out the window. I doubt very much that the beast is five paces tall with claws like swords and can devour a man's soul by simply looking at him. He scoffed. But this is where I wanted to go a little bit further and not just show that but actually show about the divisions in society because, again, we have divisions in our society. So his next line is, besides, everything about the games is barbaric. Men fighting to the death for the amusement of others, it should be outlawed. To which Malant replies, yet most are criminals, right? And he says, that doesn't make them worthless, Malant. Does a man lose value as a human just because he's stolen a crust of bread? And again, that's, a, that's actually a nod to, so that's a nod to that, the whole history stole a crust of bread, and then his whole life was ruined and changed and everything like that. I love doing little nods like that, that, that nod to things. But this little exchange between, because the, then he just says, never mind all that. We have to finish your review. And we get right back into where we were at. But that little paragraph and a half, that lets you know that 
even though you just watched this massive fight with people that got just shredded and killed and there's a hundred thousand people screaming and cheering and throwing stuff and you know they all are there because they want to be there obviously the entire world isn't that way the entire there there are parts of the world that, that feel that they're much more civilized than that and so you can do stuff like this that really helps world build your cultures in very very little time and so I do, I, I wanted to chase that rabbit because this is, this is one of the things that I was really proud of in this scene. It, it is something that school scenes give you because you can not just show the magic system, but you can also show how the pupil is taught and how the pupil is taught and what the teacher is like also gives you a lot of insight. You saying that brings up uh, the movie Soldier with Kurt Russell, where they were children, learned to be fighters, but they would, if they failed, broke a leg, whatever, they'd shoot them in the back of the head. Like, I don't care that you're a child. You failed. You're no good to me. You're not going to be good to me as a soldier later on in life. And so, yeah, it creates this really violent, very nasty, dark world as we watch these kids grow into warriors through, through that early part of Kurt Russell's character's life. And yeah, much different from sitting in leather chairs and just kind of talking about, you know, more esoteric stuff on, you know, we shouldn't have men killing each other for our own entertainment that's that's just barbaric we're beyond that now and so yeah it's a very different world <laughs> like teaching the teaching setting and the methods of teaching also show a lot about your society so you can do two forms of rollout for the price of one you can show your magic system and you can show a fair chunk of your culture so there are i mean it's a trope for a reason right it's we spoke about magic being used in combat situations so i'm going to take us through one of my combat situations that actually shows off a different element of magic in my world which is the divine magic that is used by nayera and her husbands now just before i actually read the scene let me share my screen the combat is established as nayera and her left-hand husband tahil have both shape changed not fully, so they're not animals, but they've shape changed into having armored skin. So they've thickened their skin to the point where it's the equivalent of, say, steel armor. And they've grown claws. Um, so claws that are sharp enough to rip people's throats out. And they have two bodyguards with them. But their right-hand husband is a pacifist. So he's behind them in a, in a door portal and he needs to be protected because he can't pick up a we weapon. So a sharp point shattered against her scaled back, evoking a scream of agony from her straining muscles. Spinning on her heels, she sought her attacker. Cat claws lashed out at an unprotected throat, bright blood spraying from the knife wield wielder's jugular vein. A third assailant reached for Darasaya, still crouched in the doorway. A glittering finger knife curled from the assassin's fist a gleaming arc of death. The hero's breath seized, her stomach cramping. Too far, she would never reach him. Then Tahil was there. He stepped before their pacifist third, the blade meant for Darasaya burying itself in his chest. Her left-hand husband smiled a bloody half-moon and stepped into the thrust. Sower charms on his wrists turned black, the power of the god rippling in every dark muscle. The assassin's face vanished as the hill's claws snapped through blood, through bones and skin, knife clattering from his healing first flesh. Shrieking his rage to the sky, the hill unleashed the power of the left-hand god. Dark sower charms leaped from every blow and tear. The fire of the god, the breath of the goddess, the muscle rocks of the god, the two-tailed lioness of the goddess. The charms echoed the hill's rage, divine blessings flowing from his destructive power. The dim silver dawn washed red under the fury of his assault. This was the attacking side of this particular magic system. So what I try to show there to the reader is both how aggressive it makes the user of that magic, how much the god's power moving through the priest evokes the rage and destruction of the left-hand god and also what the cost is because yes Tahil survived a knife thrust to the chest 
but he also killed somebody for it. Like he fed the destructive power of the God. And that is emphasized when we get to the kind of end of the conflict. So Tahil bounced on the balls of his feet, cobblestones cracking under the weight of the God still moving through him. Nahira ignored her left-hand husband as she let her Elamar slide away, familiar shape of her body returning. It would take him longer to drain the battle joy. He had invoked the god in full and fed the dark presence on gobbets of flesh torn from his enemies. You know, so that's kind of the, the cost and the limitation of this magic is that if you use it outside of these kinds of situations where you can kill somebody, you unleash the dark presence of the god of destruction on, on the world. Does, does he have to struggle with that? He does. Now, he's not a POV character, so we only see the struggle from external to him, but we see the struggle. The, the thing about the hill, Neira and Darasaya is they're all old. And by old, I mean the hill and Darasaya are both over 200 years old. Sorry, the hill and Neira are both over 200 years old. Darasaya is coming up on a century. So they have experience in dealing with these powers, but it still comes through as a wrestling match because it should. It mm -hmm. really should. And it's also why they're very parsimonious with their magic. In Ducal Air, I think they use it like three times. They use the divine magic because it carries a cost to do this. So we'll, the, the converse of what, because the god is the god of creation, which is Darasaya, and the god of destruction, which is Tahil. And so the converse of this is when Darasaya examines one of the bodyguards that has now been injured, he says, you know, I'm going to have to invoke the right-hand god to heal her. And they go to the ship, because that's where they were going before this. they were interrupted by the ambush, so they go to the ship. He stitches her up just so that she's kind of not bleeding out so that he can, you know, practice the magic. So after making the last knot, Darasaya turned to Nayira. I will need you. There is too much of the left-hand God for me to raise the right alone. This is also important because I'm showing here what the goddess does. So the goddess reflects her husband's. So Nayera can reflect the magic of either of her husband's back and make it stronger. The battle, uh, so after making the last knot, Darasaya turned to Nayera. I will need you. There is too much of the left-hand God for me to raise the right alone. The battle joy finally left the hill, corded muscles loosening, skin shedding its glittering armor, expression relaxing into calm. I will wait outside with Mira. Do you have a preference for men or women? Darasaya asked after the hill and Mira left. Ada's eyebrows knotted in a frown. No. All right, then I will take the lead and Naira will support me. I want you to sit between her knees. Do not fear. A gentle smile curved his lips. I promise this will not hurt. I need to call the power of the right-hand God and send it through your shoulder to make your flesh renew. His power flows most easily in desire, which is the precursor to the creation of life. Beloved, Naira sat down on the cabin floor, guiding Aida so that the woman sat with her back against Naira's chest. Darasaya knelt before her, reaching across the injured shoulder for Naira. Their faces met just above the wound. With gentle passion, they kissed. The part of Nayira that belonged to the right-hand god flooded her senses. She could smell the delicate scent of flowers blossoming in spring. Darasaya's mouth tasted of honey. Soft palms cupped her face, worship and love shining in every gentle movement. His sower charms came alive, the sun and glory of the right-hand god and the life-giving bee glowing gold. The light leaked from the bracelet as their passion grew, and Naira's Elamar rose, joining with the radiance of Soa. As their tongues danced back and forth, so the light danced between them, through Aida's shoulder, renewing flesh, bringing healing. Darasaya drew back reluctantly, his gaze lingering on Naira, eyes soft and gleaming. Desire softened the hard line of Aida's mouth, and he kissed her gently the last of the light of his sower charms vanishing between her lips. Nayira burned with tender passion for him. It was hard to wait, to let him examine the dagger's wound. Move your fingers, he commanded in a hoarse voice. 
Ada's shoulder bunched against Naira's breast and her fingers moved on command. Thank you. Offer the God your thanks, Darasaya rose, allowing her to stand. It is his power. The stitches will need to stay in for a few days more. Be careful of the wound until I take them out. I will, good husband. I will burn incense to the God. Ada bowed her head and left the cabin. Darasaya knelt again and Naira reached for him, their sewer charms clinking together as their mouths met. Ardor rising with every touch. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's exactly the price, however, of the right hand guard. I try to show that cost involved there, um, as well as in both cases, their sewer charms, which you know I've introduced throughout the book, is introduced as wielding the power of the god. So their sower charms become flooded with the light of the god or with the darkness of the of the left hand god. So you see the, the converse of the two magics in this scene. Yeah. And you do it well. It 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 in my opinion it just sucks the reader in. It lets them experience the magic instead of being told about the magic. And that's what I often try to do. I do use one teaching scene. I, I, you know, here and there I use a teaching scene. But for the most part, I try and let the user be in the head of a, of a person using magic and let them actually feel what it feels like. Of course, the problem with doing that with combat magic is that it does mean that you spend a lot of time in a combat scene kind of being internalized. <laughs> well, and so going back to the Genesis world, because it does have different types of magic, just like yours has the different types of magic. I cheated with my combat magic because I wanted, I wanted the ability to describe things without hindering the fight itself. Mm. And so what I decided to do is as soon as the combat mage pulls on the power of combat, for them, time stops. And they can actually look around. Now, they can't turn their head, but they can move their eyes. Um, and that's it. That's all they can do. So they can see whatever their head is pointed at. And so I will also share my scene, and we'll end with this. I'll do yep. a couple little things from this. So this is Clytus, who is a Tatsujin. So he's the combat mage. He's basically been trapped in this alleyway. There's three guys with fl flechette crossbows. That's a crossbow that fires four bolts at the same time. So there's three of those in front of him, which is 12 missiles that's about to come at him. And one guy has not very quietly snuck up behind him, no doubt with his own flechette crossbow. Even though there's only four guys with crossbows, there's also another guy standing behind him with a mace. And that's why he says five to one, no less. So I'll just go through here. And this is the first time that the readers get introduced to, they've heard the word Tetsujin, but they've never experienced Tetsujin. And I really wanted to make them feel kind of what it was like to feel this. So... Crossbows began to rise. Clytus opened himself to the full onslaught that was Sujin. The raw essence tore through the bonding stone embedded in his palm like a tsunami raging up his arm and filling him to the brim. Time froze as Sujin ripped Clytus from reality, unshackling him from the physical world for a moment. He shivered as the power invaded his body, his skin feeling as if it should burst under the strain. Everything around him became sharp as needles, clear as glass. The individual splinters of the cracked and broken wood from the mace strike that had nearly taken off his head. The foul stench of rotting fish heads mingling with human waste dumped into the sewers. The softness of, the, his silk, of his silken shirt pressing against his skin. The tickle of a bead of sweat cascading down his left temple. The unevenly worn heel of his right boot. He always became lost in the details Sujin brought with it. I must stop there for a second. Because I've had some of my editors that are like, this is too long. You need to cut this down one or two. And normally, I'm a big component, a proponent of less is more. Mm. However, I wanted to take the reader further. I wanted them to realize how lost in the details this character is actually becoming. None of this matters. None of this has anything to do with the fight. And I want it to keep going on and on and on to make them feel wow, you really are not paying attention to the fight at all. Like, why are you, the, the silk shirt, the bait of sweat, like the unevenness of the heels of your boots. And so I have had a few editors that pop this and were like, you need to cut this down. And every time I'm like, nope. And, and it's subjective, it's my opinion. But I feel that it makes the reader feel the total, you know, getting lost in the details. Anyway, 
Clearing his mind, he focused on the task at hand. His assailants were intent on firing as one, as they had no doubt been trained. And the, the man behind me shall add four more bolts of his own. Even with the essence fueling his body, he would need Alzadice's luck to dodge all 16 missiles, four of which I cannot even see. So I'm just going to stop there. Obviously, they're going to fire. Obviously, the fight's going to ensue. The only thing that I really want to talk about in here is I think it's very important to identify the different characters, something that's personal to the POV character. There are six people in the scene, five of which don't have names, and they all kind of look alike. I basically just talk about what they are. They're, they're called blood priests. And so, you know, they have their eyes are filled with uh, fervor and they literally, he knows that they will die if it means killing him. Like they don't care. I wanted to give a little bit of description. So when I start the fight, I'll have something to other than just man mm -hmm. or priest or blood priest or, you know, whatever fanatic. So the one with the mace was heavy set and the tallest of the four within Clytus's field of vision. A burn covered the left part of his head, and his ear on that side was missing. Of the three others before him, they could have been brothers for all Clytus could discern. One priest held the crossbow in his left hand. The head of the man in the center appeared too small for his beefy frame, and the last was the shortest of the group, though still a hand taller than Clytus. So those small little descriptions, what that allows me is, you'll see as I get into the fighting, I can, I can draw back on those and differentiate between them without just relying on the man and the man and the man because mm -hmm. wait which man are we talking about here and so i want to do it quickly because i'm going to fight and these guys are going to die so i don't care and so that's that's kind of my trick for doing it i like to give one detail that's personal to the pov just to kind of get into showing the fight itself time snapped back into play and clytus shot forward in a blur of movement the three priests finished leveling their weapons a fraction of a moment before four crossbow strings slapped prods in the perfect harmony of death Enhanced by the essence, Clytus shifted faster than humanly possible to his right, directly at the left-handed left priest. Again, a call back to the fact that he's left-handed. An icy coal fire tore through him as at least one bolt bit into his side. Sujin engulfed it, relegating the pain to little more than a dull distraction. Clytus ignored it and concentrated on his own attack, slipping his blade into the exposed throat of left hand. The priest managed to smack the flat of Doroshi with his crossbow, but not before the tip of the blade was halfway through his neck. Blood spurted from the jagged rend as Clytus' sword was batted out. Left hand's eye, eyes went wide, his weapon fa falling from numb fingers. He grabbed his throat in a futile attempt to stem the life from pouring to the ground. And then it just goes on. Basically, you just get to watch, because these guys aren't, they're, they're trained to fight this type of magic, but they're just normal dudes. And so the flesh at crossbows are there to help them give, get an advantage. Everything they do there, he even makes a comment of the fact that they're not afraid. And so, you know, the, he makes the comment of these men have fought a test gen before. That's something that isn't normal. Normally when somebody moves as fast as the flash and takes a bunch of bolts to the body and doesn't even flinch and, you know, does all this stuff. Cause like one guy he picks up and throws to the wall of the building. Uh, so he's also super strong at this moment. And, Yet these guys are just like, nope, we know. We've already, because they have Tetsujins of their own that they train against. And so these guys are obviously an elite force designed to kill this specific type of mage. And so all that is shown through this fight. Like what I like is the same thing as what I do in mine, which is show how the magic looks, show how it feels, show its effects. But it doesn't matter at this point how long Clytus can keep it going. We'll get there. We'll figure out what the limitations are, how you remove it, how exactly you draw an essence, like the stone in his palm. Does it mean that if he loses the stone, he loses magic? How does that, you know, how does it tie in? How do you get the stone in your palm? Is it literally in his palm? Like, is there a hole in his hand? You know, things like that. Technically, <laughs> the stone has been introduced. You haven't seen it yet because he's wearing gloves, even in the scenes prior to this. So you do know there is a stone and it is embedded and you do know that's where magic comes from. But you're right. You don't know how he got the stone. You yeah. don't know if he loses the stone. Does he lose magic? Now, later in the scene, he fights another Tetsujin. And at the end of the fight, he chops the guy's right hand off that has the stone. And instantly the guy is no longer connected to Sujin. And so that's where I teach you, oh, yeah, no, if they lose the stone, they lose the magic. And... It also teaches you the importance of it because he can't kill the guy because of reasons. Uh, mm. 
um, because he's also massively injured and there's other people there, but they're kind of at a stalemate. And so Clytus is going to back away. But as he does, he takes his sword and he stabs the hand and he says, this is mine. <laughs> and he slowly backs away with a severed hand because he wants the stone. And mm. you learn how important these stones are and how rare they are and what they're used for. And yeah, all that, again, it's not so many people fall into the trap of, oh, I've got to explain this stone and how it works and how we got it right here where they're never going to understand the fight. Sure they will. They understand that magic comes through the stone and it's embedded in his hand somehow. That's really all they need at this point. And but, Clytus already knows. Why would Clytus ever think about that stuff? Even worse is putting your whole magic systems explanation before you ever get to combat so that you can just write the combat. But like my dude, readers will understand. Give them the minimum. Everything that you leave out is a reason for them to keep reading. Yeah, I closed the chapter with the Malant in class. Mm. But I wanted to introduce Tatsu Jin because we had we had met Clytus and he'd actually used Su Jin, but we didn't know he was called a Tatsu Jin. We didn't know anything about it. Basically, somebody in, in his first scene, somebody tries to pickpocket him. And he doesn't mean to, but he draws on the power so he can reach up and grab the guy's hand and then hold it because he's super strong at that point. And the guy is much bigger than him. And he's just like, I think there are easier targets, my friend. And the guy lets go of the purse and kind of pulls back. And that's important because one of the things, like as he's, he's like, how are they tracking me? Because he's running through these alleys mm. and yet they're there. They're constantly there. So what you find out is even though that little innocuous scene of a pickpocket, you realize he wasn't trying to pickpocket me. He put this thing on me little magical tracking device and so he figures that out obviously way too late but he does figure that out you know at the end of all this so it starts building the magic it shows how all this stuff works in the classroom scene even though you'd seen because that's chapter four where you see him do the little thing with the pit pocket you don't really know anything about it you also don't know that it's not normal so one of the things i love about the classroom scene is the seer's like you know what are the two types of magic and milan's like Sujin and Sulak. And he goes, what's the difference? You know, Sujin is for manipulating things. Sulak is for manipulating living, you know, things. And so they go through that. But I want to drop, um, I'm sorry, Sukai. I'm sorry, yeah, Sujin and Sulak. I want to drop Sukai because you've kind of seen it, but you don't really know what it is. So Malamp says, but what about a third, the third type of magic? The one they call Sukai. And then you get him going, yeah, dude, I know people talk about it, but it doesn't exist. No one has ever shown that they have this ability. It doesn't, like, maybe, yeah, there was a textbook and they actually talk about, because I want to show that the world is much more scientific. So they actually get into, they don't talk about DNA, but it's kind of the same thing. He says, well, you know how sometimes there's parents where they'll both have brown head and they'll have a redheaded child. That means that the trait of redheaded children were in both of them and they both passed it along. So maybe, you know, my theory is, is that maybe Sujin was real at some point, but people stopped passing along the trait. So the reason why I love that scene is because it also shows you, wow, this is a pretty advanced world. This isn't, yes, they're still riding horses. Yes, they're still using swords. Yes, you know, this stuff, but they have schools and they have research and they actually think about things and they push themselves past just, you know, Conan and mm. rituals and stuff like that. This isn't, you know, a much more scientific world than than what a normal, what you might normally find in a fantasy world. And so that's, again, by, by dropping in the fact that they know that you have, that someone has to have that trait for a child to have it. They don't know about DNA. They don't know about all that stuff. Or maybe they do because they do have access to look inside of you basically with magic. So I'm just trying to set that up. But the beautiful thing about chapter four, where they're like, yeah, this stuff doesn't exist. You also know that it's used as kind of like a ghost story that if you ever meet a Tatsu Jin and Ali, they'll just kill you because they're, everything has to be secret. But they're laughing about it because like that doesn't exist. And then in chapter, whatever this is, chapter 10, you actually get to watch the two try to kill each other to get that stone because there is a secret war going on. And everything you heard about these rumors, some of it obviously is true because you're following along. So, it, you know, tying this stuff together, using the magic to be a part of the plot and to drive the story and everything like that. These are all different things that 
that I think you should think about is you're crafting your, your story and how you're going to use magic to move the plot and impact the plot and so on and so forth. And definitely don't put the rules of your magic system up front. Don't, don't fall into that trap. You don't need to show the magic. Let the reader experience the magic. And I'll even change it, something you just said. Not just don't give the rules of your magic system up front. I don't know if you ever need to give the rules of your magic. Like, I don't ever explicitly go, you know, well, you know, we can't resurrect anybody. <laughs> I just have people die in front of a mage that heals because it actually happens in this book. And... He's, you know, he's just like, I wish I could do something, but I can't. You know, he's in the after, after more now. That's what they call their afterlife, the after more. So, so you don't need to be that specific. You, you, the world builder, obviously need some idea of how it all works. But your reader should have the magic system unfold around them as they go. One thing fantasy readers are so attracted to fantasy because for one of the reasons is they want to explore, they want to learn, they want to discover. And if you puke the history of your world up front, if you puke the history of your magic sword up front or your prophecy up front or your magic system up front, what are they discovering? Like, that's the thing that's always torn me, when, especially growing up, you know, having to live through the, the fantasy of the 70s. Some was really good. And we already talked about Joe Rosenberg and I think um, Jordan was really good. And Aspen was also um, another one of my- Glenn Cook. Uh, Michael Moorcock. Yeah, Cook, Michael Moorcock. I mean, we can list them, but I can also list the bad ones, which I won't do because we don't like poo on things. But there's a ton of bad ones out there. I think it's bad. But all the bad ones to me were always the ones that had three chapters of, in the days of old, the magic sword was cast. And it's like, dude, like I can learn that as I explore your world. I don't need you to puke it at me. And so I think that's the gist of, of us going through these four scenes is just to kind of show you the most heavy-handed one was Malat in class. And yet, look at all the other things that happen in there. I build society. I build how people look at each other. I build the, the you know, fact that they know that traits are passed on from you know, parents to children. There's a whole bunch of other stuff in there. And then there's also a main conflict. There's a huge that we didn't even touch on. But there is a massive conflict that, that, our dear, uh, that Malant is slapped with, basically. He learns that what he's about to do is not as safe as he thought it was. And so, you know, that's a big jumping off point for the, for the rest of his story. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes on that, that chapter, not just I'm, you're in a class and I'm teaching you about magic. You know, it is. And I did cheat on that. And I do. I mean, it's in there and I'm fine with it. Again, it's the only classroom setting that I've ever written. But he is in a college. You know, he is there. So I took advantage of it. It doesn't feel out of place, even though I really do everything in my power to stay away from tropes like that. But it works. And if it works, it works. Here would be the takeaway for this podcast. And this is not just magic. It's in everything. Stop thinking you have to give your readers information or they won't understand X. Come up with a more organic, clever way to show them that information so that they can use their intelligence because readers are very, very smart. I know people love to joke about how stupid readers are, but you're a reader and I'm a reader and I know I'm not stupid. I don't know about you, but... If you treat your readers like you're stupid, I think you're doing a disservice to them, especially epic fantasy readers. Like they're the smartest, in my opinion, and best and awesomest. And yes, you should buy my book because I love you to death. But no, I mean, seriously, epic fantasy fan readers are a cut above in my mind because the stories are so complex and they want to discover this stuff. They want to, to experience your world as it unfolds in front of them. They don't want to read an encyclopedia about every aspect of your world and then go into it because they know everything. Give the reader enough that they will be able to follow the action and keep the rest for them to discover. And if you liked what we did here, you should definitely check out our various books and other things that we've got going. So on my side, Book one and two of Sangwheel Chronicles is for sale on Amazon. Link to my Amazon profile is in the description. And on Drake's side. I mean, I've got I've got one thing that's new. It's a children's thing, Snurse the Magic Mike for Fairy Tale, which is available on Amazon. Um, the next brutal writing advice. I, I'm this is the first time I'm gonna announce it. I'm actually very, very excited about it. 
technically the third book was supposed to be my hero's journey book, but I still have a ton of work to do, a ton of research. I'm still plotting that book out. And so because I've got so much other on my plate, I've been dragging my feet on it. And a couple of weeks ago, I started writing a, a new Drake's Brutal Writing Advice that I'm absolutely excited about. And I, I'm, it should be out. My goal is to get out by January 23. So just in a few months. Um, but I'm calling it the Holy Book of Grammar for Prose Writers. And it is literally a book on grammar. I'm teaching grammar, starting from the very beginning, what a simple sentence is, go through adverbs and adjectives and all those. And those may sound like, well, wait a minute, I know a lot of that stuff. Yes. But what this book is completely different is, is after I teach the grammar topic, I then talk about why it's important to prose writing, how you can bend the rule, if it can be bent, how you can break the rule, if it can be broken, how to use the rule to its maximum effect to impact the reader. So yes, I'm going to teach you grammar, which I think you should learn, but also I'm then going to take it a step further and show you a ton of examples and a ton of reasons and a ton of things to think about and how to use that grammar in your writing. And on that note, we will see you soon for another one. Bye.